everybody. So today, back on the podcast, Alex Leonidas. How we doing, man? Doing great, Dave. How about you? I'm good, man. We were just talking a little bit about how the whole industry is kind of advancing and certainly within like the natural community. Um, we realized that it's actually been over two years that we've been chatting. And I guess that means it's been probably closer to three that I met Jeffrey Barry Schofield. And just that whole community has, has gotten some really big following on Paris, Bald Omni Man. Yep. Now he's working with um, Omar, right? And he's got a sponsorship. I mean, it's it's cool to see that kind of development and like whole new generation of guys coming up. It's interesting how guys had even less than 10,000 followers at the time that we first did our first collab. Mm -hmm. And now they're approaching 50K, 100K. And then some channels, like we discussed earlier, Renaissance Spiritization, he had a similar sub count to me at one point. Now he's 1.2 mil. Yeah. So everyone's taken off. And what's very strange about it is that it feels like one integrated, long, yet short blur at the same time, if that makes sense. What I mean is since November of 2021, I mean, I was having these guys on my channel as well, doing some interviews, and it feels like I just talked to them yesterday. Even you, we were discussing this earlier. It seems like, you know, everyone is advancing, growing, getting sponsorship opportunities, and the physiques are evolving as well. Like you look at Paris, he was 170 when he started his YouTube channel. Yeah. Now he's, uh, I believe, 205, wow. looking a lot bigger. He's uh, huge, basement yeah. bodybuilding almost has 18 inch arms. And what happened? Yeah, you know, I feel like I'm the one who's slowing down compared to these guys. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, I love to see it, and this is what I always wanted for the natural community. Yeah, we're no, all it's growing great. collectively. It's funny too, because and this is something I I even referenced back when I was I was on a swim team for like one year when I was when I was young, and part of like I was a decent swimmer, um, but part of it was like because I had just swam since I was a young kid. And I was in this lane with these other people and I could tell there was this one kid. And I was like, okay, I'm faster than him now, but I can just tell that because he was completely new, this kid is going to surpass me and he's going to be the leader yeah. of this lane. And in the same way, like when I started the podcast, I was already like 15 years into training. So there wasn't going to be huge changes. And so you could see some people where it's like, all right, maybe we're the same size now, but you're five years in, you're seven years in, and exactly. we're going to watch as you progress. And so like, I don't know how long Paris had been lifting, for example, but he was somebody who was like, wow, like you still got a lot of runway. Same thing um, based on bodybuilding, right? Landon, mm -hmm. I think he was only five or six years into lifting when I first spoke with him. So it's like, okay, if you're still at, intermediate. Yeah. So, and you're almost at 18 inch arms, like you, you still got a lot of runway. You're only in your early twenties. Exactly. So exactly and they hadn't tried everything yeah. i feel like guys like you and me have gone down multiple rabbit holes and like for example paris he wasn't training his arms at some point mm. and now he it's he trains him religiously with high volume i believe a dedicated uh, segment as well so it's no wonder that he's gained uh much size since then yeah yeah for sure one of the things i, I definitely want to jump into today is trying these different things you know at some point i want to jump into calisthenics and whatnot. I, I think you had mentioned on a podcast or somewhere I had seen you talk about how you had had some different goals. Like at one point you were doing all this neck and trap training and the bear mode mm -hmm. thing. And I think you were saying you were potentially going to switch that up a little bit. And I've, I've been yes. thinking about that as well. And I'm going to be cutting soon. So I got recently to the heaviest I've been in years. And so um, other than recently getting sick, which kind of <laughs> put a halt to the diet, sure. I, I plan to, yeah, right, exactly. I will say my best cut was uh, 2020 and that started with the worst food poisoning I've ever experienced in my life. So <laughs> easy first a few pounds there. So with, um, with, these, with these different methods though, one of the things that I've been talking with Brian Borstein and Abel about is bro splits. And we, mm -hmm. uh, we all kind of like, crap on bro splits because they're obviously not ideal and you're only training muscle groups once per week. And, and one of the things that Brian has talked about and I have as well is like, you know, sometimes it could just be more fun, especially if you're at this advanced stage, like you and Brian and I are, it's like, how, how much do you emphasize just enjoying your training and how, how much does that contrast with, Hey, no, I still care about this above everything else. And I've still got to try, like, I've got to do what I think is optimal just in case there's a half a percentage of progress left in me. And how do you weigh those? Wow. There's a lot to unpack there, but regarding the whole bro split thing and training how you want, I feel like that is important because ultimately consistency is what will keep us training for these next coming years and inching away for those last five, 10% gains, if it is that. And the difference between an optimal 
program versus something that is very effective, it's probably not significant. So it's more important to follow a routine that you're going to get after it. 100% effort, never skipping workouts. You love the training. And ultimately, when you've been doing this for so long, the gains are so minuscule that does it really does it really matter in the end? Like I can run a bro split right now and my physique will probably look the same even if I do gain a bit of muscle in the next year. And I can then come out and make a video saying, oh, look, I switched over to uh, chest day, back day, leg day, arm day, shoulder day. That's what, you know, did it for me. But really, it's just the fact that I trained for another year. Yeah. So the it's also when guys talk about optimal training, a lot of the exercises they do are not fun. And personally, I mean, I've tried listening to these guys and experimenting with these movements. It bores me to death. <laughs> I can't bring myself. And there's also the time factor as well. You go to a gym, everyone is doing it now. So it turns out that old school training is what's available. I can walk over to any bench and get a classic workout in using exercises that I'm familiar with, that I know where I stand and I can progress on. And at the end of the day, my gains will probably be the same, if not better, because I'm giving it my all and I prefer it. And also, a lot of what's novel, we don't even know if it's better. Because last I checked, there are no randomized controlled trials on you know, exercise selection, comparing the long-term muscular outcomes in trained lifters. It's all speculation based off biomechanical inferences. And Dr. Mike has said that a lot of times uh, these inferences turned out to be incorrect. So what, what if we're assessing something the wrong way? Because there's a lot of debate going back and forth on that, right? Sure. So what I could trust is the old school basics. They've never failed me. They never failed my audience. And I know that the results will be just as good. So I enjoy it. I'm going to get after it. Ain't nothing to it. And the split is ultimately a personal preference thing. And frequency is important in the context of volume. What I mean is if you're doing 10 sets a week for a given body part and you split it up into five sets done twice a week, that theoretically should give the same gains as doing 10 sets in one workout once a week. So, you know, we, we can argue, all right, the sets might be less, uh, they might not be as good quality, right? There was more fatigue buildup within the session. Maybe you fit, you half-ass your accessories towards the end. That, that is possible. But if your work capacity is good, I can also say that's not an issue and that I'm giving it all I have for that given body part, right? Instead of trying to mix in multiple muscles. So there's different ways to look at it, but I believe in the end, all things being equal, correct exercise selection for your needs, good proximity to failure, good rest intervals, and equivalent volume, is it really going to fucking matter in the next year of you going through a bulk? Right. I don't think it will. So that's why you have to weigh out enjoyment versus what's practical. And then mixing it in with, uh, you know, what makes sense. Do you have any examples of some of those lifts that you said just bore you to death? That you, that you that were theoretically optimal. All right. I'll give you one iliac pull downs. Okay. <laughs> That's what came I, <laughs> first of all, why am I going to waste my time doing each arm when for one, I could already do one arm pull-ups just saying, but look, besides that I can just do a ring pull-up and I'm getting the independent loading benefits since the rings move laterally, they move with my body. I'm performing the function of the lats. Full range of motion is excellent strength potential. It's stable enough. Anyone who says they're not unstable has clearly never, sorry, anyone who says they are unstable has never gotten strong at the exercise because there are street lifters doing five plates on weighted pull-ups and all the variations. It's a competition movement. So if you can compete in it, you can max out on it. There's no limit to the amount of percentage backdowns that you can perform. And we know that it guarantees big backs as proven by lifting history throughout the decades. Why am I going to default to a new exercise that came out in what, 2019? That so far, I'm not seeing the results that guys are claiming from it and has a lot more cons because one of them, and to my knowledge, I'm the only person to talk about this on YouTube, is that you actually have to weigh down the bench to perform the iliac pull down. 
Now, the reason why you don't see this in these exercise demonstrations is because the demonstrators are weak, plain and simple. Mm. They're so weak that they never even experienced this con. Yet for me, within a couple workouts, not even, I was immediately getting thrown up by the weight. That told me right there that the stability profile is not good. It's actually worse than pull-ups. The only way you can make it good is if you weigh down the bench and you got to put a lot of plates on there. And preferably if you have a little bench attachment, you can suspend it off that. And then there's also the fact that your body's still going to want to come up because there's no leg support. So in an optimal sense, you would want something stabilizing you from the rear, like using bands or even wearing a seat belt, believe it or not, which sounds psychotic, but that's how you would yeah, do it. Yeah, some machines with it, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's what I'm saying. There are machines that are already designed. Hammer Strength has some excellent ones where you mm -hmm. are pulling in the sagittal plane, chest supported as well. You got leg support. I mean, why would I not do that? Why would I not do a Hammer Strength pull with excellent loading potential that I don't have to weigh down this damn bench you know, like it just doesn't make sense to me and it's going to be available. See, the cable station in modern gyms is the most occupied. I can't even get a workout in. So mm -hmm. at this point, I don't even bother. If I'm going to go to a gym to use free weights, I might as well stay at home in my home gym. That's how annoyed I am at looking at this. So the Iliac <laughs> pull down is one of them. And if I compare it to my ghetto pull down, that's actually more stable because <laughs> you got the legs up, your body's not flying up and you got that tripod stance, you know? So, uh, yeah, I, I love to shit on that exercise, but I can I can list I can list more if you want. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny. So I I just finished designing my home gym. I mean, I I could probably add a few more things and probably will over time. But one of the one of the reasons was just the frustration with dealing with people at the gym, and this thing is taken and that thing is taken. Because I would say, yeah, like obviously not everybody's going to have let's say a hammer strength pull down machine in their home gym. Um, but yeah, if you're going to be going to a gym like a commercial gym anyway, there probably are some good machines. Um, I think. Obviously, there are people like Cassim Hansen and, and whatnot who would probably provide better arguments than I would. And actually, I, I should be able to meet up with him uh, in April. And, and we'll, we'll see. We'll see how, you know, his instruction on some of those exercises cool. go. Yeah, see, yeah. So we'll see. I, I like Cassim Hansen. I'd love to interview him. I've been following him for a number of years now. And I've actually considered buying his course. I would do it. Okay. And I have nothing against the man. I think he does an excellent job at clarifying his positions. What I do have a problem with, and Kasim has also mentioned this publicly, are the people who regurgitate his content, his content without context. I have a really big problem with that because mm. they don't give nuanced arguments like him. They're not smart. They don't understand what he's saying. And I can break down their arguments in two seconds because they haven't thought it through. Kasim has. If I talk with him, you're going to get a back and forth that's like very detailed. But your typical influencer who literally just went on Kasim's Instagram page and copy pasted because that's what they do. They don't know biomechanics. I promise you they don't. They're the ones who are getting the traction, getting a lot more views, surpassing him by a huge margin. They're the loudest. They say the most black and white nonsense. And surprisingly... They're the skinniest guys as well. Oftentimes, mm. they don't have better physiques than those who train in a different way, you know. But the guys that cast and professionally coaches, that's great, you know. And uh, I believe uh, Brian Borstein did implement some of those strategies and yeah. also Alberto Nunez for his lats, you know. Yeah. But what I would also say to that is, is if you understand the biomechanical principles, you can apply that to other exercises. For example, if you, if you want a length and biased calisthenics exercise, it's actually the rack chin. So you elevate a bench. Those were popular in uh, dog crap training. Yep. You have the feet up and you're doing like an inverted row pull up hybrid, you know, or if using rings, like I mentioned before, you can leverage the rib cage. You can get that stretching across the body. And there's a bunch of other exercises that I could list. Or if you're using the L sit pull up, you have that spinal flexion. So you're fully lengthening the lower lats, you know? So, and even the, the, the ghetto pull downs that I talk about, that essentially is, an iliac pull down just perform in a different way like the stability profile is not uh equal so if you understand the concepts i think it makes perfect sense uh but shitting on what we know works and then trying to come up with you know for example people talk about the bench press not being a good pec builder because the the, the pecs can't fully converge the, the, sorry the humerus can't fully converge because you're on a restricted barbell so you're down here right 
Well, last I checked, you are maximally stretching the pec. You just can't bring the arm fully across the body, which is irrelevant in this context because it's gravity operated. So if I'm just doing length and partials down here and we have the stability aspect of the bubble bench, which is very much up there. I mean, I got a watermelon pec builder. There's no way I'm going to have trouble uh, developing my muscles there. And I don't need to do dumbbells in this context because even there, you can argue that the squeeze is not better. And then we, we have to also ask the question, is the shorn position really that hypertrophic? According to recent data, maybe not so much. Potentially, there could be some joint angle adaptations that help in promoting uh, you know, lockout strength and stuff like that. Maybe there's some extra little gains that, that can come out of it. But I found that a lot of these novel exercises focus too much on the shorn position. It's always all the squeeze is better. Okay, great. But is that really relevant in this discussion? It might not be like a wide grip pull up in the frontal plane. When your arm is at 90 degrees, the squeeze is very important. So you can't be doing half reps there, but for some muscles, it's actually not that important, especially when there's really no leverage at the end of that range. Yeah. So, so, so just to clarify for the audience there, just regarding the bench, when you're saying it's gravity dependent. So basically you're saying that, Hey, if you're doing a dumbbell bench anyway, when you're going from that fully extended position in towards your chest, you're not really getting much resistance there anyway. Like you could argue with a cable, yes. you are, but really if you're doing exactly. a dumbbell bench versus a barbell, not much of a difference if you're just bringing it in anyway. Exactly. And if you want to get a better squeeze on the pecs, uh, that's where ring pushups come into play. You can bring the arm fully across the body, or like you said, with cables, uh, Kasim Hansen has his, uh, what's that? The, the, the press around. So you can squeeze all the way across. I mean, that's complete humoral adduction. So, uh, and machines generally do a better job as well. Like even your basic hammer strength, you're you're getting the converging and the squeeze right here mm -hmm. with the hands coming close. With dumbbells, you're not really getting that, not to mention the fact that they grow in size anyway. So even if theoretically that were possible, uh, the size would prevent you from doing it. Bigger dumbbells, uh, sure. I, I guess the only other way would be to attach bands come from the side, but then you're doing an accommodating resisted dumbbell yeah, bench. Yeah, Guys aren't sure. going to set that up. So yeah. And are you, the rack chins, what were you specifically saying was the advantage that in theory they would provide oh, over? So the rack chin would provide similar benefits to the iliac pull down because you have spinal flexion. So you're fully lengthening the lower lats and you have your legs up, which when you become level at the lockout, the body is more horizontal. So there's no tension there, right? Therefore it's length and bias. It does not have the same resistance curve as a traditional pull up lap pull down or basically any pull for that matter. Uh, and then you have the stability aspect. So you have the foot contact. So you don't have to worry about your core and there's nothing really pulling you up. You're doing that, right? So it ticks every box for hypertrophy. And then if you use the rings, you could leverage your rib cage. You could get the best squeeze and it is joint friendly. So that's, that's yeah. why I like them so much. And then if you just want to load them, you put a plate on you or a vest or whatever. You don't need that much. 25 to 45 pounds, you're killing it. But again, that's for those who like calisthenics and you, you enjoy doing that exercise. I think yeah. it's badass. I used to do rack chins a lot actually, but as like my primary exercise and I got pretty strong at them. And eventually I just found the loading to be a pain in the ass. I mean, you could just bring a dumbbell over. Um, and then I, I started getting some weird like back sensation during it. So eventually I just cut it out completely, but there was probably a good five to seven years where I had it pretty regularly. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. But like you, said, you, you, you would, you would, <laughs> you would agree that it, uh, did wonders for blowing up. You know, it, I always find it this hard with, with back specifically because my core back movements over the years were pull-ups, rows, deadlifts, yeah, right? And so it's like, stuff. <laughs> no, it's like, which things specifically did it when I was doing all of them over the years. And this is even something I asked Jeffrey Schofield that last time I talked with him. It's like, you know, in one sense, I know he would say, well, if you're an advanced lifter, you should know what, what's worked for you and what hasn't. And it's like, sure, like broad strokes, yes. But when you've implemented the key things for so long, it can be hard to know, well, did that one exercise I added really do so much more in the context of all this nutritional stuff going on and the sleep stuff and, you know, the surplus. And it's, it's just hard yeah. to like make it specific. Now, obviously, I think we can kind of add certain exercises. We're like, you know what, I, this just doesn't feel right to me. Like, I just don't connect with this. Um, so in that sense, yes, but as far as like, I'm sure this exercise did this thing, I think that can be very hard to truthfully, you know, kind of 
um, just conclude? Yeah, I would say you have to go through a specialization program where you completely omit the exercise for a very long period of time. And uh, I can actually give an example of that in my yeah. situation, which would be in 2016, I did not bench press for an entire year. I only did overhead press and various landmine presses. And what happened was my chest, I would say, shrank a, a little bit, but not that much. Uh, and I was still able to bench over 315. So the strength was actually maintained from doing vertical pressing. And the upper chest improved a little bit from doing those landmine presses. And that's probably because uh, of the circular strength curve, right? And then the fact that I didn't do lateral raises for, for years and my side delts also grew, well, then I can correlate, all right, vertical presses work your side delts or else that would have been impossible because it's not just, you know, oh, a couple months without doing laterals. We're talking years and years. Mm -hmm. So I think in controlled situations like that, you can kind of use your common sense and be like, yeah, this is what happened. Sure. But when guys are mixing things up <laughs> every other month, it's like, hold on there, buddy. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess I would only, I would give some leeway to those who follow up a conjugate thought process, but uh, anyone else, no. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, there's certain things where, okay, like you have or haven't done this thing. Actually, the lateral example is great because there was a while where I'm trying to think who it was, I think, I believe Jeff Alberts had said that he had strictly done vertical yeah. pressing for his delts for years, like no yes, laterals. He did. And, and then the one arm version. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think maybe Steve Hall said like the exact opposite. He was all laterals and, and like that was pretty much all he did. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I have a buddy with great delts and he does yeah. no shoulder work at all because of a baseball injury. So he literally just does like a lot of chest yeah. work and just genetically, he's got these really capped delts. And so obviously genetics factor right. as well, but yeah, it's hard for me to say that I know there was some debate with Omar and Mike Israel about the, the value of like the overhead press and whatnot, but it's hard for me to argue you know, against it. I honestly, I think everybody's right because <laughs> it all works. You're just, you're taking a different route to get there. Like even in the example you mentioned of your friend who only does chess work. Well, I can connect that to the calisthenics world. A lot of guys are just doing pushups and dips. Many of them do not do handstand pushups because they either find it annoying to get into that setup, especially if they're training outside without a wall. I know they could use a fence and other things, but a lot of guys just don't want to do handstand pushups. So it's very common to just see high volume pushups and dips. And you'd be surprised a huge percentage of these guys have massive delts because at some point you get so strong that you can't not stimulate it. And then when you're doing all your pulling movements, the rear will get pretty developed. So even if the side is potentially lagging ever so slightly, I mean, you got the base down, right? And that can easily be corrected with a little bit of work on the side. So you know, uh, the overhead press thing, I, I mean, I shared my two cents as well. And uh, Omar put one of my clips in his video, which I appreciated. But the way that I see it, it has a, an excellent stimulus to fatigue ratio. So that's the one thing I disagree with Dr. Mike about. And uh, I find it strange that he, he mentioned that, you know, I think he mentioned anyway, it's been a, a couple months now that it's, it's, it's that it doesn't have the best SFR but I find it to be the complete opposite because most people don't even need more than 135. Like I would bet 90% of lifters cannot do that even 15 times. And that's very well within the hypertrophy rep range. It's actually the yeah. lower end of it being, yeah. it's like half, you know? So, and, and if you're overhead pressing less than your body weight is bracing really a problem. If, if a man is 180 pounds and he has 135 in his hands, I mean, that surely should not be an issue for rep work. So I, I don't, the only time I buy this is if you're absurdly strong, you know, as in repping over your body weight. And that actually was the case for Dr. Mike. Right. I mean, he was repping 275 and hitting two plates like it was nothing. So this is Ridiculous, freakish yeah. level strength that, yeah. you know, most of us can't even relate to. So in that context, I would say the overhead press, uh, you know, is harder on recovery. You know, I've run into that issue myself with the AD press, you know, because I had that back support, I was able to lift a little bit more weight, but not the standing, never. Because I don't, I don't even need 185 for that to get a great mm. workout, especially if you're controlling the weight. If you do it the way that Dr. Mike instructs with a slow negative going all the way down, uh, you, you really don't have to go heavy. So yeah. to me, it's it's an excellent builder for everything. Yeah. Yeah. And it, like you said, it can be humbling too, because there's like the amount you can lift. And I mean, obviously this applies to any lift, but definitely I've noticed with the OHP is that, you know, what you can kind of force out in a one rep max that you're really psyched for mm -hmm. and you just really explode versus somebody says, Hey, 
do a controlled negative 10 rep set and just like, you know, the whole thing is really pristine. I mean, it's, yeah. it's so much less weight. It's just, it almost is a different movement. It's, it could quite literally be not, no exaggeration, a hundred pounds less. Yeah, for sure. Your rep work could be a hundred pounds less than your one at max. What other exercise can you find that does that? You know? Yeah. I mean, you, you could with low percentages, but this is not even assumed. Like for example, if you bench 315 and you want to do for, for a single, right. And you want to do rep work with uh 225. I mean, that's uh you can get, you can do a three by 10, no problem. But, uh, man, I lost my train of thought on this one. I had a good point to raise. What I'm saying is you would have to go higher than 225. You'd have to be in the mid 200s, probably even closer to 275 to get an adequate percentage. Sure. But if your overhead press is 225, there's a very good chance that you can't even benefit from 185 for rep work because it just scales in a weird way. Your five rep max might be 185. Yeah. So what's more likely is that you're going to be in the 135 to 175 zone for very probably in the five to 10 rep range, which yeah. might sound like, but how is that possible? It just is, you know? So the way it scales is just different. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. How long ago you said it was a few months that you had worked out with Mike. Was that, where was that? So that was actually in Atlanta's gym in Laval. So in Quebec, there's the Island of Montreal and there's various uh, locations around it. So Laval mm -hmm. is like, more up you know and it's actually i didn't even realize it's one of the best gyms in canada and a lot of americans fly down here just to train there and it's been no joke it's like a 20 minute drive from my place so i'm probably gonna mm -hmm. sign up i didn't you know even um what's his name um, there's this classic physique guy that showed up there a couple months ago mm. he's in like the top five lineup it's a popular gym yeah and you know dr mike was in the area he hit me up and I uh, showed up awesome. and I uh, was instructed by him and uh, Jared Feather, both great guys. And, you know, the Scott, Scott DeVito guy as well. Man, they will humble you. Yeah. <laughs> like you, yeah, they will strip you down. So what were some of the takeaways? There? I mean, obviously those guys are both openly enhanced. Obviously you're very pro natural bodybuilding and just natural lifting in general. So did you feel like all of their training takeaways were applicable or what did you take oh, away yeah. for your own training? A hundred percent. I would say that their teachings in person changed my life. It completely mm. revolutionized. I'm not even, I'm not even just saying this to make them sound good. Like it's the truth immediately. I, so the biggest takeaway is that hypertrophy specific technique allows you to get more out of less weight, which is what I freaking live on. That's the meme of my channel because at some point you get so strong that every exercise fatigues you. You know, you're benching 315 on the regular, you know, you feel your joints, you feel, you know, what that set does to you. Then you got to complete the rest of your workout, you know, you're overhead pressing big loads or, I mean, everything kills you. It kills your recovery. You're exhausted. And what Dr. Mike and Jared Feather show me is that you don't have to overload all the time. You can use self-limiting loads with this form that just makes everything hard. So I'll give you an example. And I just talked about this in my recent video. Uh, I think it was two weeks before training with them. I did a reverse grip bench at home, 315 for seven. I show up at the gym, okay? First set, I believe I got 275 for seven on the regular flat bench. Okay. So that, that is a significant drop. And I came in there fresh, fully ready, you know, pre-workout, feeling good in the morning, no confounding factors, was well-rested, bulked up. I didn't get any weaker from two weeks earlier. And these guys take me down half a plate using an easier grip. And yet I'm struggling because the negative was greatly slowed down. It must have been four to six seconds uh, really holding that pause. And what's important is that you don't rush the final part to get to your chest. So a lot of people, they'll control the majority of the repetition, but that little end they'll kind of like sink it in, you know, sure. and they'll actually let their chest collapse ever so slightly. So what Jared was telling me is you have to imagine that you're resisting the puppet master. There's someone pulling you up and he described it, quote unquote, you want to arch the shit out of your bench. So in the comment section, you'll actually see guys are like, yo, why is he arching so hard? Well, Jared was telling me to do that. You want to really open up as if you're stretching on a door 
and you're exaggerating it. So not only are you letting the bar pause on your chest, but you're actually pulling it into you. So how powerlifters will say you're bending the bar, right? Here, you're not only bending, but you're like rowing it into your chest, but actively, like you can feel the fibers ripping apart and it's incredibly painful. So the controlled tempo, it, it, it just strips you. And it's, it's not regular tempo training that you're used to because you're intentionally, you're magnifying every cue. And I did this on the flat bench, on the incline bench. I was, I was brought down to 65 pound dumbbells. You know, I can do the 120s on the incline. I'm using 65 pounds. And Dr. Mike does 80 pounds or 85 pounds. Jared Feather does 90, 95. And I asked him, do you actually train this way off camera? He's like, absolutely. Ever since I trained this way, my joints feel so much better. I'm still just as strong. What do you, what do we have to prove? He's like, I can bench 500. You can bench four or five. Get more or less weight. So, and I, and I train that way moving forward. I did the same thing on the dips. And you know what? That's a great way of building end range um, mobility. Because a lot of guys struggle to get deep. Well, if you ease your way into it, you're going to get the maximum stretch. You might take down a couple plates off your dip. You might go from four or three plates to one. Real talk. Or body weight, right? So there's that. The joints, the mobility, training the, the best position, the way to stretch. And then the beauty of all this is that it doesn't hurt your strength. So I train this way, and you can see it on my Instagram page. And I went and test my reverse grip bench again. And what did I hit? 315 for seven. The same load that I had done before I met up with Dr. Mike. And how much so later that's how was I that? Knew. I don't remember. <laughs> but uh, it wasn't that, like it wasn't too far off. Mm -hmm. And I had just started a, a cut. So I lost okay. a little bit of weight, three yeah. or five pounds, something like that. But the fact that I maintained it, doing this slow training with 225, because that's what I was lifting at home. Mm -hmm. I mean, that told me everything. So sure. the emphasis on technique, the same thing with the pull-ups using a 45 pound plate. I, I actually, actually, I would do this for months on uh, chins and I ended up setting a new PR four plates at 175 pounds, which is a 365 total. So not only was this teachings beneficial on the bench training, but it helped me get a new lifetime PR on an exercise that I used to overload the shit out of. So that's, that says everything. And even the bent over rows, although with that, I've kind of gone back to introducing a bit more body English because I find it just doesn't have a good strength curve. Yeah. You know, that lockout, I feel like you do have to cheat a little bit, but I do like the deficit aspect. So you stand on a mat or something, you can get deep round the back and try to use control cheating. Not that you're just jerking all over the place, but in terms of the form cues to get more out of less weight, it's on a different level. And the coaching in person, I can't explain it, but it's not like watching your technique segments because they will put you into place. Mm -hmm. oh, and one more thing, even the benching, they were the ones who made me start flaring my elbows out. After years of following powerlifters saying, mm. you want to keep everything tucked in, I started doing the opposite because of them, uh, especially on the incline bench. And I feel my pecs more than ever before. It really stretches it out. So now I mix in both. Yeah. You know? So those are well, some I of the think... important takeaways. Yeah, no, that, that's awesome. And I think like you said, you, you mix in both. I wouldn't want people to get misled in that. I do think if you were to, let's say do two years of like very slow controlled bodybuilding training, you would eventually lose some of that explosiveness and power. Um, like I don't think any football player would be told yeah, to do all of your training. <laughs> yeah. And just for the purpose of strength. Right. Yeah. Of so, so just, I just want people to understand that, like, just because you went back to an exercise and we're still able to hit PRs a month later, whatever it was, doesn't mean that over a year, like I think about some of the lifts I used to do, you know, I used to rep 315 on front squats and there's no way I could do that right now because I don't train like that at all. Even though my legs might be yeah. the same size, like there is absolutely a, a, an adaptation to that type of training. So just, just to clarify, I, I know you know that. I, but. I would agree. And I think you do reinforce that movement pattern. Like uh, since then, uh, I have a hard time going faster. My body kind of limits itself. I don't know if it's fear or I don't know if it's just because I prefer feeling this way, but I don't rush my negatives. Even if I'm trying to do an am rep, I'm, I'm eventually just going to slow down. Like my body says, nope, this is the safer form. Just do it. Which you can say is not as good for getting PRs, but, uh, I mean, everything has a trade-off, right?
Sure. Yeah. And, and I think from a bodybuilding standpoint, they're totally correct. I mean, and, and you see that with some older guys as well, who still have a lot of muscle mass and most of them are not doing this super heavy, super explosive training. Sometimes you see it, but most of the time they slow things down, you know? Yeah. There's just, there's less peak forces is what yeah. it is. And the fact that you can strip down the load by 50 pounds or whatever it is, it's just, I feel like it's important for those who are strong. If you're not strong or you went through an extensive cut, maybe you, you know, you lost 20, 30 pounds, you're lean or shredded. Yeah, you can probably use your normal form again using the initial loads and it'll feel the same as if you went even lighter, but then slowed down your form. But in this case, is there really a benefit of injury prevention when absolute load is factored in now that you're weaker, you know? So, so like if you go from, let's say you're, you're bulked up, you're benching 275 for sets of 10, but you were like 20% body fat. And then you cut to 12% body fat and you're hitting 225 for 10. I mean, it's only 225. You don't have to use that kind of technique. But if you do want to, you'll be down to 185. So that's a personal choice, right? But either way, your recovery is still going to be okay. So what do you think you I mean. would do? Because I, I think the RP guys would probably say for anybody, yeah. if you want to maximize hypertrophy, you should do it that way. Other people would say you know what, get strong first. Once you are, you know, using hundred pound dumbbells uh, for reps and everything, then focus on this stuff. I, I'll give my opinion, but where do you fall that's, that? I'd love to hear your opinion. You see, it's like, we can argue, you know, theoreticals and then there's the real world, right? What would I personally do? I would just get strong and then start doing that. Cause I mean, that's, that's my journey, right? And that's my bias. But could someone get to the same level without doing that? Probably, but I, I'd love to see it you know, play out in the real world among real naturals, you know, yeah. but I would say it likely would work in the event where, you know, the weights aren't too far off and you're not over exaggerating it. Like I think when I trained with them, they really did it on purpose, like to really take me to the next level. Sure. Uh, but I don't think they actually train that slow under negatives. So mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be a six second eccentric. It could be three seconds, four tops, yeah. you know? So there's levels to that as well. Yeah, I, I would agree with you in terms of how I would go about it. I think theoretically, if you were there in person with them every single time, you could probably get similar. You could even argue better gains by having somebody with, with them. This, yeah, in person. Absolutely. Yeah, with this pristine yeah. form on everything. I just my issue with it is that. I could absolutely see a world where there are a ton of these kids who are coming up. And they're keeping all this perfect form and they're using 40 pound dumbbells for their bench presses and all this stuff. And you can imagine how somebody could do that and not be that big. Not if we're looking at the, yeah. the process, but the end result is I could absolutely see a lot of people doing that. Meaning having, let's say a three by 10, 50 pound dumbbell bench and not being very impressive. I yeah. cannot see people getting to three by 10 with 100 pound dumbbells and not looking reasonably impressed. I see what you're saying. Yeah. It's like, what, what do you see in the, like, what's more likely to occur that a guy who's just horse cocking big weights, but it's through a full range of motion <laughs> that he's not going to be jacked, but the guy who's lifting half of that is, is going to match it. I don't know. It's the, the thing is we can go back and forth all day about this, but it's all just speculation. We'll never know unless we start seeing guys doing this on a mass scale. And to my knowledge, I mean, there's no natties who've ever done this. There was a video you know, of Kai control Green. from day one. This is probably actually no. I think about it, I haven't seen Kai Green in a while. Um, you know, for a while, like obviously he was always going against Phil Heath, and then there were years where I was talking about his comeback, and then that never happened. And now I, that I think about, it, I haven't heard him brought up in years. But in any case, there was a video of him where he was curling like thirty pound dumbbells, and he's like, you know, I don't focus on the weight; oh, it's yeah. all about the squeeze <laughs> and all this stuff. Meanwhile, yeah, yeah. in the same video. He was doing barbell rows with like 400 pounds. And it's like, okay, yeah, but like benching 500. Yeah, like insane weights. And the reality yeah. is all of these guys, like it can be very misconstrued by some of these IP pros. They're all strong as hell. Even if they're not demonstrating that strength at all times, they're very strong. I 100% agree. And the main reason why they do this is because they probably will get injured if they don't because mm. they're so damn strong. And the thing is, not only are they slowing down their form, and it's perfect, right? But they're also using high reps. So 
I mentioned before that I was doing 65 pound dumbbells on the incline bench and Dr. Mike's doing like 80, 85. How can numbers be that close? Well, because I'm in a moderate rep zone, he's doing that for high reps. So even though the loads are quite comparable, the reps are in a completely different game. Like 10 versus 20 is massive when we're mm. talking about the dumbbell sure. bench. So I would say that they're still strong no matter what. And if they do decide to follow a short-term powerlifting program, they peak or they just, you know, use their old technique, they'll get new PRs like that, you know? So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So let's dive a little bit more into the uh, the calisthenics topic because you had mentioned that you, you certainly have more experience in this area than I do. It's something that I have toyed around with only because it's like, well, you know, there's certain things that I just, I don't think they would invigorate my interests that much. For example, to do strong man right now, just not really yeah. something that I care that much about. Um, flexibility goals and whatnot. It's like, eh, it just doesn't do it for me. Some of the calisthenics stuff, I'm like, that. that's kind of cool. So when I think about that, there are certain, I guess, landmark strength goals that I see that are really impressive. I mean, you're talking about guys doing like five plate pull-ups and whatnot, which is which Yeah, is we see this now. <laughs> um, totally insane. So um, I, I guess, how long have you been doing the calisthenics stuff? And are you seeing, do you see yourself going down that rabbit hole more are you kind of done with no. some like the heavy one rep max stuff i'll so the one rep max stuff uh is usually correlated to my bulks because okay. that's the best time to you know capitalize on that but i don't really want to do much bulking moving forward i realize it's horrible for my business every time i gain weight uh like my analytics go down by you know two to three times wow. no exaggeration all my sales everything social media you know just to say, when I was shredded, I was getting eight to 9,000 likes a photo. The moment I gained the weight back, it was about four or 5K tops. Isn't it incredible? So, like it's, Everybody can be on the same bandwagon. No, it's good. We're the be same person. Fat, but yeah. it doesn't matter, man. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's crazy as hell. And nobody cares about your PRs. You know, I told you about the reverse grip bench that I hit before. I believe that post got like 22,000 views, you know? Uh, compare that to some of the shredder footage that was getting 60,000 views, wow. you know? So it, it seems like the most impressive shit that real natties are like, whoa, like that's, that's next level. It performs the worst. Yeah. So it's like, I'm going to keep killing myself so that people don't respect it. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's about me first. Right. But it, it does suck when you put in all this work and guys are not reciprocating. So it's yeah, like, okay, sure. you want to see shredded. You want to see calisthenics. Fine. I love that too. So let's do it. Let's focus on these skills and, I what think not? Jeff saw but, the uh, same thing when he got shredded his last cut. Yeah, especially him. My God. That's when he started getting the fake natty accusations. It wasn't yes. before. But you see, I always knew Jeff had a great physique. Because for, for one, I mean, you can see it, obviously. But when I do interviews with people, I download all their workout footage. And I go through it so that I'm painting a story in this hour and a half or two-hour podcast, right? And I'm looking at Jeff's physique. I'm like, fuck. This guy's a really good physique. And this was, I believe, December of 2021. And I was already very impressed. Mm -hmm. And he hadn't, he, his arms weren't the size that they are now. But I could see, like, he's going to go far, you know? But, you know, it takes that eye, right? Like, obviously, if someone shreds down and they look like a Greek god, it's because they were already massive during their bulk. But I guess people who don't, you know, who follow these unrealistic standards aren't aware of that. They don't realize sure. that a, a guy with a fluffy arm, for example, if he loses that inch of fat, it's still going to be a shredded massive arm. Yeah. You know, but um, to answer your question about calisthenics, uh, I before I started lifting weights, I did it for a good three to four years okay. at home. Yeah, almost almost every day. And I went from 120 pounds to 143 pounds. So I had abs and uh, I was able to do 15 muscle ups. My first day of going to the gym, I was already doing weighted pull ups, weighted dips. Wow. I was able to do 50 dips the first day I stepped into a gym. And uh, I mean, there was a little bit of a base, you could say, right? Yeah. And I worked out of the park constantly. It actually, it was a kid's playground. That was my calisthenics park, mm. right? And I did jogs and all that. So that was always my first love. And even when I would lift weights, I, would, I never gave up the calisthenics. Always did my push ups, pull ups, and dips. The only thing I didn't do was bodyweight squats because I found those were too easy. Mm -hmm. And I would say that 
I have more calisthenics experience than lifting experience. If you actually add up all the years of training, I mean, that 13 years includes the calisthenics. When right. I say I've been training for that long, I mean, that's, that's part of it. Right. And lifting might be 10 years, you know, and therefore I will never stop. And right now I'm doing burpees every day. This is day 38. We're up to 250 a day. And I'm just going to keep ramping it till it's 500 a day. And that's wow. the best thing I could do for my conditioning. Hmm. And then, you know, capitalize on the skill work. When you're lean, you excel at moving your body through space. So why would you not take advantage? You, that, that's the one area where you can get PRs. When you're bulking, your bench is going up. When you're cutting, it's your planche that's going to increase. Your weighted pull-ups are going to get better. Dips maybe will suffer a bit, but overall, the pound for pound is to your benefit in that sport, you know, in that environment. So it's just, it's nice that you can alternate back and forth. I might not get PRs on the overhead press, but I will get PRs on my handstand pushup. So let me ask you then about, cause that, I haven't released it yet, but I just did a podcast with Abel about pull-up strength. Somebody asked me and what you said kind of indicates something similar. So what I found as I had bulked up from about 190 to about 205 to 210 was that my push-up, so I was doing kind of like a decline. So for people listening, by that, I mean the equivalent of an incline bench, right? If you're doing a decline push-up, right? You're working your upper chest. So right. I was doing a decline push-up. And while I was gaining that, you know, 20 pounds or so, I was getting a little stronger on the push-up. My pull-ups got slightly weaker, but about the same, which I was okay with. Cause I'm like, Hey, if I gained 20 pounds and my pull-ups didn't go down at all, like, you know, that that's a win. Exactly. Um, and, and I figured that was for two reasons. One, because I find pressing strength tends to go up more with bulking and two, because just proportionally, if I am horizontal, then the amount I, I am adding is not as significant as what I want to pull up your vertical, I am pulling up that entire amount of weight exactly. I'm adding, right? So those two things I, I think kind of explain it. Um, but what I what I find interesting with the pull-ups is that it doesn't seem completely proportional to the weight I add. And, and the best way I can explain this is if I kind of go in reverse. So that is to say, let's say I'm doing a pull down and a pull up and I'm 210 mm. pounds. And let's just say yeah. it's 45 for 10. If I drop from 210 to 180 i drop 30 pounds i might lose 10 pounds on the pull down not a lot but my pull up will maybe go up a couple reps with the same weight yeah and you look at that and you'd say well hold on you've taken away 30 pounds of body weight shouldn't you be able to add 30 pounds to your pull-ups and in my experience that doesn't happen at all what's, what's your experience I have the exact same experience. Yeah. And I, I haven't been able to figure it out. Yeah. Maybe it's because of stability. I don't know. May, perhaps it's because we're using those shitty pads and we need something like a belt to support us down further. Maybe it's the grip width not being equal. Like a lot of guys use that super wide pull down bar. And mm -hmm. that would kind of make sense. But assuming it's equivalent. So let's say you're doing a chin up, same grip width. Uh, same here. I always lift less on the pull down. 100% of the time. And I guess that's the difference between open chain versus closed chain. And maybe there's a specificity aspect to it as well, or the fact that you can manipulate your body in space. So you're changing the body angles to make it easier. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe you're turning it more into an inverted row. Whereas with the cable, I mean, you can't really change the direction of resistance unless you're, you know, further away with a bench. Mm. Uh, so like could be so much... many possibilities when you like, I don't know how much you weigh right now, but you've gotten up to not, you know, you never really get above 200, right? Like maybe 190 is like is 200 was uh, my max weight. Uh, okay. Last year I got up to 187 right now. I'm 167. So I'm 20 yep. pounds from my peak bulk. Okay. So, uh, so 187, what would be like a six spread max for your pull-ups? Oh, five, six, seven, you know, something in that range about uh 140 pounds probably Four, i think that's six. what i did yeah yeah okay. i think it's on my instagram as well i think okay. yeah i think it was 140 for six okay and then let's say at 157 so 30 pounds lighter at roughly what your six for max is do you know mm, probably similar, similar. Or a bit higher 
Right. Probably okay. a bit higher, actually. Or yeah, about this. Yeah, not that different. But right. what I'm saying is, it's it's the pull down and the pull ups don't scale the same way. Like yeah, yeah, it's just according it's just to my super, body weight. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So but when I bulk or cut, it, the the numbers tend to be quite comparable, if if not like like for example, like I look at the total load. Right. That doesn't change much whether I'm super lean or, or heavy. And if it does change, it's because I actually gained a significant amount of strength. Mm -hmm. Like like my total pull up PR, I believe, is 15 pounds higher from last year. Uh, but I was, you know, I did at a heavier body weight. Yeah. You know, so you can say my pound for pound strength was worse, yet the total number is higher and I'm lifting the same load. So to me, I view that as a strength improvement. But others would say it's not as impressive i don't know yeah uh, some people yeah some people it's, it's very it's odd like that load load yeah and some people don't i i don't ever like when i'm writing it down i don't use total load i just say what's attached to me just oh, yeah? for consistency purposes um but again like i said like i don't i find that pull-up strength seems to be maximized for people who are kind of that and again this is exactly what i was just talking about with able kind of that middle ground body fat like nobody who's really fat is doing super yeah. impressive pull-ups but at the same time if we're talking body weight pull-ups yes it's going to be like the lean calisthenics bros absolutely but i find that the strongest people like the guys doing you know four plate pull-ups are generally those like 180 to 205 pound yeah. guys like they're i would agree really aesthetic but they're kind of middle of the run you know yeah, I, th I think it's just because you have more muscle. Yeah, you know, those skinny calisthenics guys you're talking about, a lot of them weigh between 135 and 150. So, and they don't train legs to top it off. If they yeah, did yeah. train legs, th that's another 10 pounds, right? Probably. So, by design, they're not going to have the best absolute strength. They're, they're, what they display pound for pound will be impressive, but the total load won't exceed a guy who weighs in the range that you're talking about. I would say it's between 160 and 200. Although yeah. the 180 guys, I feel like that's the perfect weight yeah. for a calisthenics athlete. Even yeah. like for me, 175, I'm flying on the bars. That's yeah. where I'm number one. Yeah, because there's a point where it can just be more muscle because, you know, I've lifted with some really heavy guys who are enhanced and not fat, like lean and enhanced. And eventually yeah. the, the increased muscle, it just, outweighs the benefit of the strength that there's just too exactly. much body weight you know exactly yep and that's what we see with you know even the rp guys you know <laughs> yeah but uh i was gonna say something about that if you look at uh the world record holder for the pull-up right now uh matias i believe what's his name I'm, I'm bad with these names today man i don't know what's going on <laughs> no worries. but uh he just got a new pr recently i believe it was five plates for a set of uh eight and um, I would say his body fat is maybe 15%. I got to look this you know? guy so, up. What's his name again? Oh, Matthews Lat. There you go. You know him, right? Matthews what? Matthews Lat. And they're always Russian, by the way. Because the, over there, they got tons of uh, outdoor parks. The Matthews Method. Let's see. Fitness FAQs had him on his podcast as well. Okay. He's a strong dude. But th that's just, there's a bunch of these guys, man. If you look at street lifting athletes, uh, we're seeing lows that are incomprehensible, including the dips. Over 300 pound dips on the regular. That's crazy. Yeah. Like my repping friend, 225 instead of 10, you know? That's insane. Yeah, my, my friend I mentioned who doesn't do any shoulder work, he got pretty strong on dips. He was like 165 doing four plate dips for reps. And he uh, but and I, I was trying to keep up with him on them. And they just killed me after a while. I found one a lot of sternum pain from them, mm. which is somewhat common from what people tell me. Yeah. And then two, um, just recently I've been getting some weird outer pec tendon issues, like at the insertion point. So I'm really trying to not do anything that's like overstretching it. Um, just yeah. been a couple of things I've been trying to heal up lately, but yeah, the sternum thing was always a problem. So are you, are you able to do uh deficit pushups? Yeah. 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 Okay. Cause that'll probably give you the same muscle building benefits and you have better stability as well, but it won't give you that you know, sternum pain, which is, yeah. uh, I believe it affects one in four people. You mm. know, some say it's a structural, others say mobility, others say just potential overuse. 
I think it can be improved upon with time, but there's some guys that no matter what, it just doesn't seem to go away, especially as they get stronger. Like Austin Dunham uh, used to be known for heavyweighted dips. Now he can't even do them. You know, really? My friend, same thing. Yep. Wow. Because of that pain right in the center. So, uh, yeah, it's one of like, I, I mean, I love dips when I was growing up. Um, I was doing dips well before I was doing pull ups, and I was pretty good at them. Not, not anything like the guys you're talking about, but relatively, I was pretty good at them. Yeah. Um, and I just like the movement. I just think it's great. But, uh, sure. between the, the, like the injury risk and when I was going super deep, cause I think Mike likes them. I think Dr. Mike Israel likes them. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like uh extended range of motion, not yeah. just 90 degrees. He wants to rip on your shoulders <laughs> yeah. out of the socket. Yeah. But the thing with that is you have to ease into it. And in my case, like that's not something that was new to me because I had that background of deficit pushups and ring pushups. So I'm used to stretching out the pec tendons real deep, but if you're not mm. used to it, you know, and also the, the absolute strength needs to be there. I'm a firm believer of that. So, you know, before we were talking about like, let's say some beginner tries using some of these techniques early on and he's just lifting the 50 pound dumbbells, right? Well, if you, if you make him lift a hundred pounds, you know, his tendons can't handle that deep stretch. He's going to be, you know, first time he might strain something, but the other way around, it wouldn't apply. So maybe we can, you know, from that perspective, someone who can do heavy weighted dips when they strip down to body weight for high reps or a plate or two. And now they're getting that extended range of motion with the pause. They feel fine. But someone who just tries that day one without already being super strong, it could just be too much for them to handle because you are maximally stretching the pecs. Yeah. But there's not too many exercises that I could think of that do it to that extent. Like I would say a weighted dip will stretch your pecs more than a dumbbell bench. It, it, it just is what it is. Cause you're going, way through you know and you can actually sink your body weight into it yeah yeah you're not limited to the dumbbells potentially hit it like depending on your width for the dumbbells if they're hitting your chest and then so. there's the bench too the fact that you're you're pinned back against it you can't mm. stretch as much yeah the dip you're in you know there's nothing restricting at all it's yeah. just your mobility what are some of the injuries that you see with calisthenics athletes mm. biggest one is going to be golfer's elbow so okay. It's going to be pain right here. So golfers is on the inside and tennis elbows on the outside. Tennis, right. we don't seem to see as much. Uh, that That's killed so many calisthenics athletes. Uh, there's also the sternum pain that we talked about before. And uh, sometimes shoulder, which is usually caused by jerky repetitions, specifically from muscle-ups is what I've observed, especially mm -hmm. when they do that, that chicken flapping technique. So if you're doing explosive pull-ups, which, as we mentioned before, increases the peak forces, and you're not used to handling that, and then you're also using bad form, and you'd be surprised how common this is with muscle-ups, I mean, it's a wrap. Eventually, you're going to snap your shit up. Then the other problem is a lot of calisthenics athletes do absurdly high volumes and high frequency combined. So their, right. their fatigue management is poor, mm -hmm. and they end up getting overuse injuries just from their general training, not because they're doing something wrong with their form or anything like that, but it's just repetitive. So yeah. that was one of the uh, reasons that going back to like, even like the bro split topic, there was a acquaintance of mine who was a PMR doctor. So physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor. And he, he's been doing bro split forever. Uh, and, and also a guy who is natural, more or less maxed out. So it's just kind of, you know, what he enjoys. And one of his arguments was to say that like, even if it wasn't ideal, and I think he does find his split to be ideal, but even if it wasn't, there is an overuse potential with some of these higher frequencies or with the bro split. Like one of that. the reasons that I'm even considering the bro split with Brian was just to say, all right, like it's not actually the method of training I prefer. I actually just started it last week and I had a back day and then a chest day. And I was like, all right. So you I'm isolate more... at the end. I'm just curious. Say again. On chest day, on chest day, do you hit triceps at the end or is it just chest? On this one, I did not know. I was just doing back and the chest and the okay. legs, etc. Gotcha, gotcha. And uh, right. it was kind of boring. And I'm so used to doing upper lower splits. So I'm warming up and I'm like, okay, I just warmed up a back exercise. I guess I'll just wait for the next. And I'm also used to doing antagonistic supersets. Mm. Always, like always, because I like to maximize my time. And so I did back and then I'm like, I guess I'm just waiting for the next back set. So I feel like it's inefficient. And then my next back exercise is weaker, which annoyed me. So I don't actually like the one times per week frequency, but wow. from a orthopedic standpoint, I, I could certainly understand it. Um, but it, yeah, it was a little boring. It's, uh, um, it's also the uh, the overlap of muscles. With the bro split, if you set it up correctly, 
there's never there's not even many overlap right whereas uh when when you start messing with you know comb combination muscles you'd be surprised how it can bleed into your sessions For like sure. my rule is this it's got to be at least 72 hours of recovery and that's where the upper lower excels at because you know push pull same session you hit that on monday thursday same muscles you know everything's recovered yeah. Uh, the only potential con with that, if we're going to talk about overlap, is what you do on your lower body days. If you're doing a lot of axial loaded movements, sure. maybe you're hitting the back again. So perhaps it won't be recovered on the Thursday session and you plan on doing something like bent over rows. In that case, you might have to take out the lower back. So there's small considerations like that. But in general, the bro split does a pretty good job at separating things such that, you, yeah. you know, every muscle feels fully fresh, actually to the point of annoyance. You know, you yeah. come in, you're like, damn, I can't wait to <laughs> hit right. it again, you know? Yeah, it depends. It, it, you know, bro split encompasses a lot of different potential routines. And so it yeah. really depends on how you do it. Like if you do a push-pull legs, then you are truly only hitting everything once per week. Conversely, if you're going to go really extreme and go chest, back, shoulders, legs, arms, well, then you're technically hitting triceps three times a week, right? Yep. So then if, if orthopedically you're like, oh, I'm going to do a bro split because I want to give my elbows a rest. Well, then the split I just mentioned is terrible because now you're doing pressing exactly. three times a week. So yeah. you really have it, it's bro split can be many things. And you really have to look at why you're changing your routine. I agree. And, and I've thought about this a lot. Like, what's the best way to divide these muscles that so there's no overlap whatsoever? And uh, what I realize is, for one, you can you, if you mix in different splits, then that kind of solves it. So if you combine upper, lower and push pull and the order matters here. That completely solves that problem. So here's what I mean. If you do upper, lower, off, push, pull, there's no overlap whatsoever on the push, pull. Like zero at all. For the simple reason that the upper, everything was hit, one shot. Thursday, you know that's good. But then the Tuesday session, which was your lower body, this let's assume that there was some axial loaded motions in there, right? Well, that has no effect on your Thursday session, which is a push. And you'll also be recovered for the Friday, which is going to be pole, but that's now back, you know? And the next time you train legs again. Is this a pole that would include is, like deadlifts and whatnot as well? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Or just a bent over row, right? So it doesn't matter, you know, how you set that up. But if you invert the order, so the same routine now, but you do push, pull off upper, lower. Now on your Thursday upper session, your back will not be recovered because you did pull on Tuesday. because So you had one less day of recovery, even though you're training both muscles at the same time. I hope that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. But the order is extremely important. And that's why I always look at it as 72 hours. As long as you have that and you minimize the overlap, you're going to be good on any split. Yeah. So, um, and, and obviously that's not what most of these calisthenics guys are doing in part, because I think generally the load, the load doesn't have to be lighter but it often is lighter if you're doing high volume and high, and high reps and whatnot. Yeah. So you probably, it sounds like what you were saying, the injuries are more overuse and not so much I would like agree. pairing muscle groups and tendons. No, no. Uh, nine out of 10 times it's overuse of the areas I mentioned earlier, including the wrists. Right. Mm. And, you know, like you said, it's going to be high reps, very high volume, high frequency. It's just, it's kind of inevitable, but that can all be avoided if you just train like a bodybuilder. And actually do less volume because a common issue is, uh, you know, junking up your sets. You know, you got guys hitting well over 300 push-ups in a session. And like, that's completely normal. It's not unrealistic. You can do that every week, no problem. But your shoulders might not like that. Neither your elbows or your wrists. But your muscles could do it, right? And that's where a lot of these guys think they're okay. They're like, oh, I'm a beast. I'm hitting, you know. 300, 500 a day, let's go. But it creeps up. So mm -hmm. what I would say to those people is you don't need to do that many sets. I'd rather you change change up your form in a way that it's putting you in a low to moderate zone. So this, you know, you don't have to go above 30 reps to get a freaking stimulus, right? And then the other thing is you want to use variations. So don't just do basic push-ups. As we talked about earlier, do deficit push-ups, feet elevated to hit the upper chest ring push-ups. I mean, even with the worst calisthenics program where you are overdoing some of these variables, as long as you rotate something in it, that 
goes so long in reducing overuse injuries. And then obviously just avoid the cheating garbage, which is all too common on pulling movements, you know, or uh, see for, for pushups, I can't even say it's cheating anymore in the context of not locking out your elbows. Cause I used to talk shit about that. Right. I would mm. say, Oh, it's because the prisoners, they don't know any better, but it looks like they were doing length and partial. So I'll give them slack on that. If you want to just pump out fast reps, cool. But for pull-ups, you can't get away with that. You're going to strain something, mm. especially muscle-ups. That's the biggest offender by far. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I've done a muscle-up just to see if I could do it, but it was like a one-time thing. I've actually never used rings before, so that might Ooh. be a new thing for me to try. You got new gains to unlock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of trying to balance right now doing something that's new and fun, but also just kind of take some time to help some of these random like nagging orthopedic things. Nothing that's like serious. Like I haven't like torn a pack or anything like that, but just things where I'm like, you know, I, where I ramp it up and then I feel it here and I ramp this other thing up and I feel it there. That's just been happening a little bit more. So yeah. I kind of got to go through some program design. Well, if you're going to do rings, I got your back. <laughs> yeah, it's a good <laughs> resource for that. Cool, man. Um, so where do you see your, let's say, next few months going? Because is, is that, are you like, okay, now I'm going to be lean Alex here and I'm going to start doing more calisthenics? Are we going to see videos on that? Yep, that's what we're going to do. I might even do a, a road to shredded series. Okay. When I lose uh, a little bit more weight, you know, the, the last 10 pounds or so. Uh, I would say that within two months after this talk, right? you will see me single digit body fat close to competition ready, but not quite there. And, you know, through experience, I've done this twice. Now I realize that it's always about eight weeks out that when you surpass it, you feel like you're going to die. So I'm going to cut it off at that point. Uh, so, you know, 154, 155 body weight. I don't think I'll go below that. I'm not okay. going to be 150 stage ready again. Hell no. And that should be easier to maintain. Hopefully, you know, I'm going to feel good. My hormones won't be a problem. Uh, last time I was okay at the eight weeks out mark. It's really when I went under, right? So we're going to see how that goes, mix in some calisthenics. And I'm going to document everything and show guys how, you know, they can excel at more things and just being this big bulky guy. And I'm also doing it with the plant-based diet, which uh, controls the appetite. And I find that it's really good for conditioning type stuff. Like the burpees I was telling you about. My arteries just feel supple. I breathe well. So uh, I've, I've been really enjoying that. And I think it's going to be key in assisting this process of getting super lean and keeping the weight. Yeah. So I didn't know you were doing So when you say plant-based diet, how extreme are you going with that? Are you doing like an actual vegan diet or are you yeah. just... Oh, really? 100%. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Been, uh, since January 1st. Oh, damn. Okay. Nice. And, and what made yeah, you thanks. decide to do that? Just looking at the evidence. Um, I've been studying this stuff since I believe 2016 and it's oh, just okay. accumulated over the years. And uh, at some point I was just like, you know what, let's go all in. Cause I was already doing it about 80 to 90%. And I figured, all right, cut out the rest. Shouldn't be a problem. And so far it's been really good. I haven't hmm. noticed any differences in terms of cutting compared to last year. Okay. You know, the strength process is ex exactly the same looking just as aesthetic, uh, feeling phenomenal, got some new PRs on burpees. So I can't complain about that. Joints are on point, but the biggest thing is the breathing, man. I can't stress that enough. I just, it's like my lungs feel clear. I don't have any inflammation in my body at all. Mm. So it was mostly a health thing. Uh, ethics secondarily, you know, I have yeah. looked at that as well. And uh, I would agree with those positions, but, uh, you know, for me, I, I want to live to hundred years old if possible. Longevity is the most important thing. And that's what this natty game is all about. That's what fitness should be about, right? To it's look so amazing, feel amazing. You know, do this for life. We were just talking, like when we started this podcast, we were saying about how we see this convergence of some of the guys in the industry doing certain things. And, uh, you know, by the way, my my grandmother just turned 100 last month. So nice. So that was pretty cool. Um, we had from one to 100 at her party. So that was pretty cool. And uh, so that side of the family has some good longevity genes. But then like my dad's dad, was not good. So we'll, we'll see, we'll see what happens with me. Um, but yeah. the women for sure have the better genes there. The, um, the, you don't know, but that's why it doesn't matter. Right. Just do your best and whatever happens, right. happens. Like even in, in my situation, I have longevity in my family. My grandmother passed away uh, in 2019 
at 99 years old. She was born in 1920 and uh, she was fat. She probably weighed 180, 200. Yeah. Never ate well her entire life. Did everything wrong and yet still live long. And her, her sister is still alive. She's in her 90s as well. And, uh, you know, they're not health nuts or anything like that. They have yeah. the genes. Yet my grandfather got his first heart attack at 53. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> who are you going to take from? On wh which side, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's crazy. But that's yeah, why, my, you know. My grandmother was a pretty heavy Italian woman. Her sister was like 98, 100 now, 96. It's just like, it, obviously, genetics is, yeah. is the biggest thing there. Uh, and like I said, inactive, <laughs> my mom's like, no, I think it's all like, you know, she had these tomato sauce and like olive oil. And I'm like, mom, I, I gotta yeah, say no. it's probably <laughs> not that. Um, but anyway, what I was saying about like the convergence of a lot of people is like, you do see that more where like, oh, like Eric Helms has talked about, he doesn't want to bulk up anymore. And like, you're talking yeah, about this. For sure. I, I have yeah. no intention of really bulking up again. Th even this last one, it was just to kind of see a few things, but I just, I don't think I'll even go above 200 again after I cut yeah. down. Um, and, and the health thing is, is part of it too. It's not like I'm unhealthy, but it's, it's just, I would prefer to feel better. And I think anybody who's Absolutely. listening is like 20 years old. It's, it's probably hard to relate to, but, and I mean, you're in your twenties, but, but even so, like you just start you, to realize, yeah. not even start to realize, cause I've, I've cared about health my entire life, but as you, you get to a point where you're like, oh, like I have friends who are not functioning as well. And I have some friends who oh, are yeah. a couple years older than me, which means that they are closer to 40 than 30. And so you start to see that stuff happen. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, we're, and it, it definitely uh, we're only getting older, man. And I'm seeing everyone around me, the, the health problems are starting to come in ever so slight. It's like, mm, you can avoid a lot of that if you do things correctly. And like you said, it is hard to relate when you're 20 years old, you know, I did the dirty bulking as well. I used to get a pack of 50 Timbits and just shovel it down <laughs> on the Metro. So I, you know, I paid my dues with that, but did I feel better compared to now? Absolutely not. It's not normal that, you know, 10 years later, I feel better than when I was 17. Like that's sanity. Right. But that, that should be what happens. And eventually we all get to that point because, you know, you, you're not immune to health problems unless you have these absurd genetics, but even then you could feel better. Right. And at, at some point you put on so much muscle it's diminishing returns. How much more are you willing to bulk? Like you're going to go through a year of gaining 20, 30 pounds only to lose it all to put on one to two pounds of muscle extra. I mean, you do you, if, if that's what you want, you're dedicated, you're going to, you know, but the journey from let's say 30 years old till 40, I think you have a little bit different priorities when you've already had, you know, a decade of hard lifting and you've done your bulks and cuts. So yeah. it, it changes a bit. Not that you won't gain any weight, but you're not going to do this extreme yo-yoing anymore. And you'll right. be probably closer, let's say if you compete, to your stage weight. You might deviate by 15 pounds or something, not going all out. For sure. Yeah, there's a reason you see that trend with, with most lifters as they get older. And uh, I'll, have, I'll put a little sneak preview here of my experiment that I just started a week or two ago. So I'm not going vegan. Um, but when I look at my blood work, pretty much everything is great but LDL is creeping up a little mm. bit and it's at a level where I'm like, do I want to consider a statin? You know, somebody like a Peter Atia would strongly recommend it for basically everybody, other people. I mean, there's a lot of theories on it. Um, I am, you know, they talk about these lean mass hyper responders, which are people who have like, if they go on, let's say a ketogenic carnivore diet, they get yep. really low triglycerides, high HDL, but very high LDL. And when I've done mm. keto and carnivore, that was me. Like LDL in the 200s yeah, on keto, not good. carnivore in the 300s LDL, um, or excuse me, mm. LDL in the 300s on carnivore. Um, but if I eat a normal diet, it's like 120, 130. So out of all the experiments I've done over the years, I've never done the following, which is basically to bring saturated fat specifically as yep. little as possible. Because That's what you there, do. there's a pretty clear correlation between saturated fat intake and LDL and most important one. I love cheese, man. Love it. <laughs> so <laughs> that is very tough for me. Um, I tried so many, and I've tried, don't get me wrong. I've tried way stricter diets than just a low saturated fat diet. Um, so it's not, it's not actually hard, but it's more just to think, oh man, I, I wish I could incorporate those things. Um, uh, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do three months. There are going to be probably three weekends in those three months where I will make an exception, which I think is probably a little bit more of a valid experiment anyway, because obviously there are going to be some times in my life when I have absolutely a piece of pizza or some pasta or something, but just those three times in the three months, and then I'll retest. And I'm very curious to see, because obviously 
Uh, cholesterol is hugely genetically determined, right? I mean, I think that's, that's pretty much been proven, but at the same time, we do know there are some things that can modify it. So I'm, I'm convinced that it'll go down. It cannot, yeah. if you're going to do this the proper way, low saturated fat diet, it's going to happen. You know, it just will. Yeah. And then we got to see how much does it go down? So my, my thoughts just, again, yeah. I'm just kind of thinking about it. Um, if it goes to, let's say certainly sub 90, maybe sub 100, I would say, okay, I'll avoid a statin. If you if can get it to 70 or below, you're basically heart attack proof. That's, that's, that's certainly right what Atia and, and, you know, Thomas O'Connor and people like that would say. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how low it goes. I already, you know, I do my cardio, well, uh, I work out, I do all that we're, stuff. Um, we're on the same boat with that one, you know? Uh, like when I was younger, I was prone to high cholesterol. And I don't really? know if it's genetic base or the fact that I was eating a boatload of cheese. Because, you know, same like you, uh, Italian cheese. household, man. <laughs> and especially the, <laughs> the age ones. <sighs> Come on. But uh, I, I completely got rid of that addiction. And uh, I switched over to nutritional yeast, which I feel, hmm. uh, you ever heard about that? No. Oh, you got to buy it right now. I think it'll what is uh, it? be the fix that you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. It's full of uh, B vitamins and um, it gives you that nice cheesy flavor. Does it taste? So does I'll, it actually? Would, don't lie to me, Alex. Does this actually taste like cheese? It's cheesy enough. It'll, I mean, look, if you've been having cheese up until now, it's, it won't be to the same level, but it'll satisfy your craving. Okay. So I would add that to everything, you know, even including your pasta. Yeah, because okay. fat-free cheese but, is just not, not the same. You know, you can try it. nooch, okay? But yeah. uh like, like I was saying, you know, when I was younger, I was prone to that as well. So mm. I'm going to do a blood test relatively soon, maybe in the next month or so. And I want to see if yeah. you know, my numbers went down like crazy. And I think they will because I've been consuming no saturated fat for the right. most part. Right, right. So so I guess yeah. like in theory, you could still have a vegan diet that had high saturated fat if you're oh, eating yeah. a bunch of coconut oil and things like that. Absolutely. Yep. I avoid coconut like the plague. Mm. You know, I, I don't and I don't have processed garbage it's all whole sure. food plant base interesting so, cool man so all right we're on a, a similar ish journey here then we'll see what happens yeah yeah let's uh compare the results yeah, see yeah what happens. Cool, man. cool all right man well i'm glad we took the time to do this had some great topics uh i know you're, uh, you're well known on the youtube space but where can people find your stuff they can find me at alexleonidas.com including the contact page uh, alex Leonidas official on ig and then youtube you know where to find me Cool, man. Awesome.